Door, I don't hear you at all. Crikey, give me a second. So excited to start, I forgot to hit the button. Hey, hey, Podnotians, welcome to the Mini PC Show, episode 104. Uh, we go live each and every Wednesday night about 9 o'clock, sometimes a little bit later. If you want to know when we're going live, you can go to the show notes and you can see all the places we can be followed. Uh, this show is completely ad-free thanks to our Patreon supporters. Uh, if you want to hear this show in uh, in all of its ad-free gloriousness, you can go to patreon.com slash the mini PC show or just go to the, the links in the notes. Uh, tonight's episode is brought to you by our newest Patreon, Russell W. Thank you very much for your patronage. Uh, and uh, speaking about patronage, how's everything going there, Rich? Good, good. I had a success after a long string of failure, which I didn't talk to you about beforehand, but I'd like to detail and give you the, the trials and tribulations that I went through. Very cool. Is that my opening to Yak Away? Sure, yeah, yeah. All righty. So um, I've been running Home Automation Assistant for a number of years, and I actually was running two Raspberry Pis with Home Automation Assistant. One with Haspian, and apparently which has been deprecated, and the other is Hasio, which basically runs in a Docker container. So finally, there were enough holes in my SD card that my Haspian died. I was like, all right, I'll just do a refresh, blah, blah, blah. Or actually, initially, my first thought was, I'll find the image that I saved, which I didn't, and reflash it, which I couldn't. So then I bought a uh, Sonoff RF bridge. It basically, it's a, like slightly bigger than a box of Tic Tacs. And it's got a mini USB port on it. And it has an, from the store, you can run an app on your phone, which allows you to push a button. It can learn RF signals. So it's a 433 megahertz uh, transmit and receive device. So any 433 megahertz outlets or whatever it may be that you have, you can control with it. So... I had LEDs in my faux skylight, and uh, it controlled my laser jet printer. It controlled a lamp in my office. And the faux skylight goes on 30 minutes before sunset, goes off at 9 o'clock. I have a routine that turns off my laser jet 11 o'clock every night, so in case anybody leaves it on, it's not running all the time. And I have the lamp in my office go on half hour before sunset and off at 11 o'clock every night. And so I'm like, all right, let me just flash this, this thing. And I tried it with a Mac, couldn't get it going, you know, with the uh, USB programmer. And then I'm like, all right, let, let me break out my uh, MSI Wind uh, netbook. Well, it was a 64-bit program to Flash, not a 32-bit program. Then I grabbed my wife's Windows PC, and, you know, you have to run it as administrator, blah, 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 so you have access to the hardware, and I couldn't get that to run. So I'm like, F this, I know how to do this. I grabbed a Raspberry Pi 3 and, you know, downloaded a current copy of Raspbian, Followed some instructions from a video I made a while back on how to program uh, Tasmodo devices with a Raspberry Pi. And boom, flashed the damn thing and got it running. And then got it talking to my home assistant through MQTT. And, you know, I guess if I started out in the morning, it'd be dark already. So it would have been time to go to bed. So I, you, ever, you ever have one of those days where you think you're going to do a 10-minute project and it's when you get up in the morning and then it's dark? By the time you're done, well, I mean, almost anything with mini computers, it almost never goes as quick as you would like it to. I'll say. Yeah, well, flashing uh, stuff with Tasmodo, uh, when you're flashing firmware on a device, if you're not real current with it, you're not doing it like once a week or twice a month. Uh, it gets to be a pain in the ass. And I really did enjoy doing it with the Raspberry Pi because it's direct on the hardware, no other interfaces, all of that kind of stuff just darn worked. So I, I do plan on putting out a video on how to do this. Uh, it's 
I might do it in segments because it's kind of a big thing to bite off uh, going through all of the process on it. And I, I want to do like a 101 starter, like, hey, this is how you load an OS on a Raspberry Pi because we may have new, a new audience and they might not be familiar with all of this stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, going by like the law of podcast, every episode, 10% of the viewers drop off, 10% of your viewership are brand new. So there's always new people. Yep. All right. So I was really interested in doing the show tonight because I want to hear tales of the Pine Book Pro. Well, I mean, they're really, I was not saying dumb. There's really not a lot to say after what I said last week. Um, it's getting easily eight hours of battery life. Now I'm not sitting at it constantly pounding the keys for eight hours, but at work, it's literally sitting next to me. Screen's always on. It's always turned down, but the screen's always on. And when I see a new hangout message, a new matter most message, a new discord message, or a new article posted to my tiny, tiny RSS or a new email. I go to my laptop and I do that. I don't do anything on a work computer that I don't absolutely have to do. Um, and it's easily, easily eight plus hours of battery life. Uh, it charges via USB C. So there's nothing I have to put in my backpack. Just it. Um, it's a 14 inch, which I didn't notice how small my work laptop was. And then, in comparison, how much bigger this laptop is in it. So I think I, that the laptop I have at work is like 11 and a half. Uh, no way. Yeah. It's a $3,000 HP elite book uh, that everyone looks at and says, how is this worth $3,000? And I just shrug my shoulders. I don't know. That's crazy. Uh, I got a 13 inch laptop for work. And, and if I do any work stuff on it, a lot of the screens that I would normally use are too freaking small to manipulate and do my job. So I, I really have to be, you know, plugged into a monitor to do something. For me, uh, I've got a 15 inch Mac, I've got a 15 inch Chromebook, I have a 14 inch Chromebook. I, I like the 14 because it's lightweight and to walk around the house with, it's pretty nice. Uh, 15 gets a little bit heavier. Uh, my 14, I guess I've had it for about two years and I think the battery's getting a little soft. So it only runs a couple of hours, whereas my 15 is running pretty much all stink day long. Right. Well, I'll tell you the good news is if this battery starts to die, technically I have the 10 hour, 10,000 milliamp battery from the original pine book, which I believe is the same battery. Um, uh, so I'll be able to swap that out. Um, I'll also say the keyboard again, I can't make it any clearer than this. The keyboard is easily three to four times better than the pine book keyboard uh primarily because i remember on the original pine book when i would type if i would type fast once in a while it would count as double keystrokes and then sometimes it would mm -hmm. like skip a keystroke that's not happening at all on the pine book pro uh the touchpad is definitely a step up to um and it's just the fit and finish of it is kind of silly how nice it is um I will say uh, the default operating system, Open Sesame, um, it's weird because I don't find information on that operating system anywhere. But it's a basically it's a Debian based custom tweaked for Pine boards. Um, I've only had two issues in the last week. One time it wouldn't come out of suspend mode because I, I do when I get up and go someplace from my desk, I do put it in suspend just because that's the quickest way for me to turn off Wi Fi. So, cause there's no Wi-Fi hotkey button. Um, so like one time it wouldn't come out of suspend. And then one time, um, I want to say, I can't remember. Where, oh, I think I was loading like crazy amount of tabs and it just sat there in a, like, a, and appeared to lock up and me just being impatient, just held down the power button for 10 seconds. And it went, uh, th those are the only two like issues I'll say I had, um, I did learn from Captain Zero that I can flash basically an operating system to an a, a SD card. And if I put an SD card in at boot time, it will default boot to that. So it's like I have two hard oh, cool. drives. So I'm going to try to do that sometime this week. I'm not sure what operating system I'm going to do it with. But since I'm doing basically a bare bones Debian on my normal boot, I'm going to try to do something different. So I guess the only thing you didn't cover is speakers. How are the speakers on that? Oh, they're definitely better, is what I'll say. They're definitely not 
<laughs> remotely close to like my three thousand dollar laptop from work, which have um the uh, Ofstein Bose whatever something bomb and Ofstein. It's something like it's expensive. It's you know it's like German names or something, so it must be expensive. Um, they it, it sounds fine. It sounds fair. It's actually kind of loud. Uh, the gimmick is though they're pointing. They're on the it's two speakers on the sides towards the front. Um, so if you, the laptop's on your lap and you're sitting incorrectly, I'll say like against your legs, you won't really hear the laptop at all. You have to just shift a little bit. And then if, if there's any space between the speaker and underneath it, it seems like it comes off just fine volume. Hmm. Um, the default OS, I will say the only other like gripes I have is a, Oh yeah. Captain's ear reminded me of this too. <laughs> if you buy one and turn it on, don't, change your password the default password until you fix the keyboard because the keyboard came over with uh uk mapping so when i went to go type in what my normal stuff was on the screen i saw that's not what i'm typing and i typed it again i said that's not what i'm typing so i knew i got lucky to go change the keyboard layout oh wow that that's a biggie well and then with that um setting the time was different. I'll say that. I typically just drop to a command line and type TZ data, time zone data, and I run that and it to set the time zone. I it wasn't installed, so I said I'm not going to install too too many things if I don't have to. So you basically had to click on the clock, click on uh edit, click on time zones, click on set time. Like it was like literally like four clicks deep to set the time. But once I set it, uh it seems like it's now fine. It does take a second after boot and logging in for the time to adjust because by default it goes with uh, UTC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will say um, I'm almost happy this laptop is not in white um, because I'm pretty sure if it was, it would like pick up just fading colors quicker uh, with the black matte finish. I do think it's going to be a, a, a touch more durable. And the only thing that caught me off guard was I'm going to need to buy an adapter if I want to use an external video, like an external monitor, because there's no HDMI or DVI outlet. It's literally USB 3, so I have to get USB 3 to, like, DVI or HDMI cable. USB 3, not USB-C. Uh, I believe, now that you say that out loud, it might have been USB-C. Okay, because I, I did pick up on Amazon a cable, actually, for the my 15-inch Chromebook, because it has USB-C, uh, it's like 3.1, which also has display on it. So I picked up, uh, you know, for a couple of bucks on Amazon, USB-C uh, to DVI, DVI, HDMI. And that works great. Gotcha, gotcha. And I do have the NVMe upgrade, but I haven't even taken the back of the laptop off yet. Uh, the, the logic is not till I'm close to buying one. Am I going to do it? And the real truth is it's always the wrong time to buy a drive because if you wait a couple oh, yeah. weeks, it's always going to come down in price. So I'm in no real rush. It has a default 64 gig internal space. Now, if I was one of the very first backers and buyers and I was on their message board, I would have got the free upgrade to 128 gig internal drive, which I got to say would have been pretty nice. So I guess I only have one gripe left on that setup because uh, no backlit keyboard, huh? No, no. And I don't see any way to do it unless you literally become like a hacker elite and play techno music while you literally crack the case and replace every key with something. Yeah, I, I'm wondering what the magic is with backlit keyboards. Are they just crazy expensive? What, what's the deal? I don't think they're crazy expensive. I think they're crazy expensive versus the normal keyboard. I think they're both cheap. It's just one might be literally like uh, 50 to 80% more expensive. And um, it's obvious. I don't want to say it's obvious they cut corners with this device because it's obvious they didn't, but it's obvious they went with a uh, normal um, the things, just higher grade quality kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I really love that. I mean, I, I just think it's fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not ready to support it. I want to say hi to Jonas. I see him in the chat. Hey, Jonas and John and Red, thank you guys for coming out. Um, and Anthony, um, I'll say this also. I turned, I put up on the screen uh, a uh, white 
just solid white from from corner to corner, turn the brightness up all the way. I had my uh, youngest son who doesn't wear glasses, the only one in the house who doesn't wear glasses. And I uh, had him watch like a little 30 second video explaining dead pixels. And then I said, now look at this screen. Tell me if you see any dead pixels. And he looked and he looked and he looked and he looked and he said he didn't see any dead pixels. So good. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So again, I'll say it like this. Uh, I'm not ever going to buy myself like a $3,000 laptop, even if I somehow fall into money. Um, because I'm, it's the bang to buck ratio law of, did, um, of, of, a uh, um, dumb diminishing r- returns, um, for 200 bucks, I think this is a fantastic value. No, you're not going to be, uh, you know, conquering the world on it. You're not going to be doing, uh, complex m- machine learning kind of things. And you do require a touch of patience. Nothing on the laptop is super snappy, but for 200 bucks, I still think it's fantastic. Okay, you know, I had a couple of interesting learning events this weekend, and so I, I told you I pulled the MSI Wind out. I couldn't believe how fast that booted. It runs Windows XP. That thing, with, within a very brief period of time, I, I didn't measure it, it was up and running and usable. Whereas, my wife's Windows 10 laptop was so useless. I, I mean, it, it was literally, you know how I used to joke, you compile something, go get a cup of coffee, come back. It, it was literally that bad. I was shocked. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, a couple of things I don't want to spend money on anymore. And, and one is laptops, because other than editing video, uh, I use my Chromebook for everything, my $200 refurb Chromebook. And I... I don't know that my uh, Mac is going to give up the ghost anytime soon, but I have been kind of trolling deals on eBay for like in the three hundred dollar range, which which are kind of tougher to get than the six hundred dollar version of or my my twenty twelve MacBook Pro Retina is a little tougher to snag the deal at three hundred bucks as opposed to six hundred bucks. Let me say that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I'll say my work laptop is the latest uh, generation i7 mobile processor with an NVMe drive. From power to login screen, it's literally three and a half seconds. Um, the Pinebook Pro, I swear, is less than five seconds to getting to the login screen. Um, and then I turn on my Lenovo T430, and it's like a minute and a half. But it still works good. Yeah, but it, it, I'm a little shocked at if if you compare the MSI Win that I have to my wife's uh, PC laptop, we're we're talking probably a hundred fold faster CPU, and we're you know multi threads, the whole shoot and match, probably four times the memory, many times the storage. We're talking. Is the OS that burdensome on on the hardware? Well, and I think it's a question of optimization too. Um, right. I do think XP was a simpler operating system, is what I'll say. Um, and I do think with Windows 10, if it's optimized for the right hardware, then it's fine. But if it's not, then you're gonna have issues. Yep. Yeah, and I did shoot you a link this week. It's not going to be in the notes. Uh, it's uh, People are now like screaming to Google, it is now time for you to create an actual video editor for your Chromebooks. And this past week, it was announced all Chromebooks moving forward from the time of birth will have eight years of support, which I think is fantastic. Holy cow, that, that's phenomenal. It, and because for me, a Chromebook, the price point is 200 bucks. And if I'm buying a $200 Chromebook and let's just say I get six more years out of it because I'm probably buying a little bit behind Bleeding Edge, I'm pretty happy about that. Well, and you just hit the nail on the head for me too. Um, I'll just say this. Technically, I do consider Chromebooks close, the closest thing to a mini PC that people buy. Um, the reason I'm very happy with them being eight years is like you, I'm probably never going to buy a brand new on the edge Chromebook because they cost the most money. And I want there to be $600 Chromebooks. I really do. I want there to be 
premium style Chromebooks, but I'm also okay with buying one refurbed like two years later or used like three years later. So then I still get five years worth of computing and upgrades and security bugs and patches and all that kind of thing. Um, so I'm really happy uh, to me. It's about time they did it. Um, they were teasing there for the last couple months, a couple devices they pushed up to six years uh, just because their base chipset was so popular. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've been, all right, so the only fault I have with my Chromebook is if I have too many tabs open and I'm playing video, it may, it may stutter. And if I close all of my browser windows, you know, restart Chrome, and it'll play fine. Occasionally I have to do a reboot, but that's my only beef. I don't know if it's my specific Chromebook or if it's the entire, you know, model that has the same issue. My wife hasn't mentioned it, but she probably doesn't have the same habits I do of having, you know, a whole bunch of tabs open. Well, I'll say uh, in my experience, because I've had the original CR48 Chromebook. And after that, I think I've had six Chrome in the house. I've had about eight Chromebooks. Um, the worst thing you can do in a Chromebook is open up a YouTube tab. Nothing else would even compare to slowing down a Chromebook as much as a single YouTube tab. So if you have a single YouTube tab and then literally like six sites open, even on a higher end Chromebook, you will see things going slower. Um, and I will agree with uh, Jonas in the chat. Uh, my main thing that I do when I'm down doing actual work is it almost always involves VMs because I use VMs like a, um, a, um, a um, appliances. When it comes time for me to edit audio i load up a vm because all the software inside the vm is stable doesn't get upgraded doesn't get updated doesn't break it just works so on my main rigs i need to just start out for sanity eight gigs of ram but to actually be sane i think i need 16 gigs of ram and i'm afraid in like three to four years i'm going to need 32 gigs of ram to be sane well, in, and that was my biggest beef about upgrading to a new MacBook Pro is they didn't have 32 gigs of RAM. And I am not going to buy a new machine and pay new machine pricing for something that's 16 gigs of RAM in nearly the same processor of what I have in my 2012. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, and there, and there is good news because phones are now starting to ship literally with 12 gigs of RAM on them. And I'm pretty sure by July to September, you're going to be able to see phones uh, at least being sold on the internet, maybe not in a store in America with 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's only a matter of time. So we kind of launched with Pi. Do you want to go straight into the Pine? I'm sorry, we launched with Pine as in Pine Book. Do you want to talk about the Pine phone? Well, and yeah, I, I definitely want to mention that the Pine, that the Pine Phone Braveheart Edition started to ship. Um, I have just seen pictures of them. I really haven't seen any YouTube videos on them except from the official developers. Um, if you look at the phone, I'll say it again, it looks very passable as a brand new type phone like three years ago, maybe um, two and a half, three years ago kind of thing. Um, you can't compare the specs of that phone versus an Android phone because they're completely different operating systems with completely different needs. The Linux operating systems that's running on these Braveheart phones don't need a lot of RAM, don't need crazy processor, uh, but they need at least a little bit and they need faster storage, I think, than the normal phone, uh, where the Android phone needs RAM like aggressively and it needs GPU like obsessively. So don't compare this. This is not apples versus apples or apples versus oranges. This is literally apples versus black holes. Just completely different. So Anthony's been chatting. He, he asked one question. I answered it earlier, so he may have joined late. Uh, my Acer Chromebook does not have an HDMI port. It's got USB-C, but it's like USB 3.1, which you get a cable that goes USB-C to HDMI and it works. He mentioned, let's see, he wants to get the Pine tab, which I think is really cool. I, and he definitely has to report in and tell us how that works for him. Yeah, the, the, to be honest, the Pine Book Pro is great. Love the battery. The Pine phone, I really would like to play with and have one. The Pine Time watch, again, I think would be lots of fun to play with. But I think the, like, the Black Sheep 
is literally going to be the pine tab because I mean, the Linux nerds have been asking now for like seven years, when can I get a genuine tablet that runs L Linux? And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's $100 or it might have been $110 for the tablet and the, um, and the um, keyboard. So is the Pine Watch shipping right now or? Uh, the developer edition of the Pine Time is shipping. It was 25 bucks. I've seen two people who got them. Uh, one of the guys said he didn't have a lot of time to really play with it, but it definitely was up and running. And when he got it, it was fully charged. And I'll say this, my uh, Pine uh, Book Pro came from Hong Kong. I plugged it in. It said it was already fully charged as well. So they're doing that right too. So that just shows you how quick these things are being shipped out. Yeah, I I want to get a Pine. Uh, you know, look, the the Pine Time is just so crazy cheap. It, are are the production models going to be twenty five bucks? I thought they said yes. I thought the Pine Phone after launch was going to be one fifty. The Pine Time, I want to say, was twenty or twenty five, and then post launch, I want to say twenty five or thirty, no more. And then the Pine Tab. We don't know when I'm going to guess by March. We're going to hear stuff. And don't forget, people, again, this is another friendly message brought to you by Captain Zero because he's the only one who seems to remember this kind of thing. Uh, we are right now at uh, January 22nd. The Chinese New Year is coming. Um, so everything's going to be shut down for over a week. Uh, they also, they have a uh, pandemic like flu outbreak kind of thing where it's going kind of crazy and their stock market took a big hit. So don't expect things to come from China in a timely fashion for the next 10 weeks, maybe. Crikey. I, I didn't even think about that stuff. Yeah. Well, and uh, Anthony saying he, uh, he got February from the blog for the Pine tab, and I really hope he's right. Um, because that's the one device where I can see being multifunctional. And what I mean is literally carrying it around like a laptop. And then when you're not using it, you could literally hang it on your wall, use it as a family display message board, um, um, a notification device, or even an interface to my, uh, 3d printer. <laughs> Yeah, now I definitely have more than a couple of links in the notes, and I'm not going to lie, Rich, I was really hoping you were going to take the time to scour through the notes, and I was really hoping that line number 1155 was going to catch your eye, because I don't know what the hell to think of this thing, except this sounds cool, fancy, and complicated. Um... This is a new website slash service that they're calling Focal, but the O has a line going through it, so it, of course, immediately confuses me. And uh, over at Linux Gizmos, it says, um, cloud-based test farms let you check out Edge AI software on Linux dev boards. Focal is profiling an automated test farm platform based on Docker and LTTing for testing Linux Edge AI software on BeagleBone, Raspberry Pi, Jetson, UpSquared, and Google Coral. This to me sounds really cool. Oh, damn. Damn. So I don't have to pay the 75 bucks for a Coral. I could just try it out on their site or, or I could run it. That's cool because so I could do machine learning stuff on the Coral, on the Jetson Nano, whatever, try it out before I actually buy one. That is very cool. Well, you know, I kind of ask everybody on every show to check out the notes before we start the show because of this kind of reason alone. Um, because this, to me, is the kind of thing, I don't want to say it's exciting, but I, it, it really is, I think, uh, something that we've never seen before kind of thing. And yeah, so literally, if you don't have access to one of these boards, you could literally take a job saying you're going to develop X for this board. You can do research. You can start all your coding, wait, and then you can use this as a platform for at least some testing before you're, you know, get your hands on one of the boards. Uh, this is the kind of thing I think more developers need to have access to because they need to know what's possible, not just, you know, here's a hundred bucks and now give me a board. 
Okay, so I clicked through onto the focal site and a little window popped up, early access get in, early access customer code will let you start using focal for free. And there's an apply button. Yeah, I mean, this is literally like, I, w I want to say this article came out less than five or six days ago and they were basically got like early notification to it. Yeah, this came out about six days ago um, and they had like early access is what I'm going to say. Um, this is, man, I really don't want to be like a Bill Nye and say it's going to change the world. But I will say this is the kind of thing which is lowering the barrier of entry to everything. And if there's two consistents in this universe is one change is always coming. Fight it. You'll be miserable. Two, the barrier of entry of everything just keeps plummeting lower and lower. And when you think things can't get any easier and simpler and more accessible to more people in the world, just wait five seconds and it does get lower. This is very cool. And yeah, Dor, thanks for shaming me. I do that to everyone. Don't worry, Rich. It's how I show love. I wasn't taught how to do it correctly as a youngster. Oh, that, that is definitely on my follow-up list. Very cool. Okay. Um, an, another thing I just wanted to mention, only because I'm, I'm literally like a fan of the company, is what I want to say. And this one is 1158, row 1158, and I really got to increase the size of the font or I got to get better glasses because I, I can't see it anymore from where I sit. Um, this one is from at least my old buddies is what I'll say over at Solid Run. Uh, Solid Run was the company, the Israel-based company that made a, I want to say it was 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter mini cube computer. It was like maybe the width of two HDMI ports. It was so tiny, small, and all the cords you plugged into it were so heavy, the cube would never sit straight. It always fell backwards, but you know, whatever. Um, Solid Run has had good um, success is what I'm going to say. They're not your normal mini computing company. They focus a little differently. Um, the example I use is their mini cube computer ran KDE as the desktop and it ran better than KDE has ran on most of my full desktop computers and laptop computers. Um, but this one isn't, again, we're going with the edge and AI. If you haven't noticed people, that's where all the money's going. That's where all the development's going. That's where all everything's going. Edge AI server packs a 16 core Cortex A72 CPU. Huh, that's fine. Okay. 16 core, you're bragging about that, but then you go on. Plus up to 32 IMX8M on a chip and 128 neural processing units. So this seems like it's geared towards video processing ML, uh, you know, object, person detection, facial recognition, those kinds of things. Well, I'll, I'll say, I don't know if it's that per se. I'll say it's just meant for that kind of intelligence. The logic is if, if we're going to go with the facial recognition thing, you have cameras all over your house that are literally dumb IP cameras with no intelligence in them whatsoever. And you have everything piping back to this one unit, having this one unit doing all of your facial recognition. But I will say, um, looking at least the history of the NPUs, which of course is not long. Um, they basically accept any kind of Python code, any kind of machine learning code. You can literally just set them off on their own to do task, whether it's just compute, you know, what does a dog look like or compute how to, uh, have an actual answer to a question kind of thing. Uh, it seemed like a pretty versatile, um, platform is what I'm going to say. Um, and I'll say this, if you take a look at it, Solid Run, I think, makes decent looking hardware, uh, not just powerful hardware, but actually something where if you look at it, you think, yeah, that looks pretty good. All right. So the only thing I can't find, I know it, I can't afford it. Let, let me just tell you that because one, there's no price on it. And I think there's somewhere I'll find a contact us for pricing. Yeah, I didn't see a price for that one. If you scroll down right next to the picture of the motherboard, it does say that there is another board um, 
that starts at $550 with it has, um, I want to say it was like a, a, a quarter in many processing units on it. Um, 16 core. I mean, that's still respectable. 16 core and where, where does it say NPU? I'm not sure, but you know, this is the kind of company, if you're looking at buying one of their products, you typically aren't looking at the price tag. Yeah. Yeah. But then again, I'm going to get NPUs for free. I don't have to buy this. Well, I'm going to guess using the other service, you're going to either be heavily throttled um, or you're going to pay enough to where in a couple months you'll probably be able to buy your own one of those boards. Right. Um, and then I'll say this. We have the uh, elephant in the room line um, 1149. Is what I'm gonna say, Rich. The one I just moved up in the rankings. Is what I'm gonna say, 11:49. Um, next cloud is. I don't want to say they're pivoting. I will say they're um, refocusing. Is what I'm gonna say. Um, because nothing, from what I can tell, nothing has changed with Next Cloud. So people running Next Cloud don't have to worry. People who were looking at Next Cloud thinking they know it, they don't have to worry. They're basically re. Focusing their marketing is what I'm going to say. Yeah, and it's a uh, next cloud is being rebranded to next cloud hub, and next cloud hub is being marketed to com to directly compete with Google Docs and Office 365, which is kind of like, um, you know, a small island nation off of India saying that they're going to declare war against the United States and Russia and China. All right. So I'm looking at their download. Um, and the download says next cloud. It doesn't say next cloud hub. Yeah. I told you that it's, it's the exact same product. It's just instead of called next cloud, they're rebranding the public facing one in version 18 to be called next cloud hub. Okay. Do. So if you're running next cloud, there's no difference. You just wait for your up update and then you're going to be running next cloud hub. And like Ooh. one of their biggest selling features is not only will you get the, uh, private secure chat with the people on your server, not only will you get the video chat conferencing on your own server, but you get real-time rich text collaboration now by default it doesn't look like you're going to get um uh excel spreadsheet type or microsoft word level of document richness in your documents but it's that it's definitely more rich than just notepad um and you get collaboration to where multiple people can be editing the file at the same time um i do think nextcloud is on the right um, trajectory to be competitive. I don't know if it's starting, you know, January 22nd of 2020 is when they start to become competitive, but I think they're on the right path. Okie doke. Uh, so it looks like they've got a whole bunch of ARM32, ARM64. Oh, okay, yeah. So it said ARM32 V6, ARM32 V7, ARM64 V8. So, yes, as a, along with what I tell, so AMD 64, etc., i386. Oh, PowerPC 64, that's funny. Yeah, and I don't really understand what Flow is, but Flow sounds like a task scheduling system, like an event scheduling system where you can set reminders or workflows to repeat. Uh, I, I don't know, but that one is the one that I thought at least sounded interesting. Uh, I will admit I'm still using my work calendar for work and Google calendar stuff for my own personal stuff, but I really barely scratch the surface on my calendar. Um, I keep telling myself I'm going to install Passman on my next cloud server to do my password management. I haven't gotten around to that and I'm going to blame it on not having time. Um, Speaking of password management, do you know who was down today? 
They were down yesterday for almost four hours, but they were only down for people who have had accounts since 2014. Last so pass. last down yesterday, but if your account was newer than 2014, you experienced no downtime. Which I've never heard of such a thing, but apparently people pre-2014 were isolated, segregated some way that they literally saw an outage. And the two people I know who swore they had accounts before 2019, uh, uh, 2014 swore that they did not experience any downtime, which I just think that they were lucky. Uh, and I'll say, don't please don't send me an email and tell me why I should switch to Bitwarden. Okay. No, not a chance in hell. I'm switching to Bitwarden and people say, but it's open source. And I say, it's not the end all be all to be open source. An example I use is natural. Just because something's natural doesn't mean you should eat it. You know what else is natural? Lead. Do you want me to sprinkle some lead on your salad? I don't think so. Unless, of course, you already have brain damage. Nothing source does not mean it's good enough in 2020. For instance, Bitwarden uses your clipboard to put everything into uh, your password fields. That sure in the hell is not safe and secure. And that's why I'm still using LastPasses because it does not use your clipboard. So please do not tell me, email me why I should go to Bitwarden. Please do your own research and find out how it's really not secure. Just because it has open source on its homepage doesn't mean it's good enough for me to use. Okay, I think we have two Hawaiians uh, live on our, our video on YouTube. I see one. Yeah, well, John, apparently, John Bertram is apparently oh, from Hawaii is. also. Good man, John. How you doing? Um, and I'll say this. Um, I, I have a dream. Oh, man. Not you like have a dream? Kind of dream? Not like that kind of dream. Um, Yo, Monday was, right? Yes, I know. And that's why it's really important for me to say it like that. But, but I, I, I'm in a book. Like six years ago, I remember saying on Linux for... For the rest of us, there's this project called Freedom Box. And what Freedom Box is going to enable us to do is to pull all of our data, pull all of our information, pull all of our private data onto a place that's easily manageable and self hostable. Um, and it hasn't. Nextcloud has a better opportunity to become that ecosystem for me, for my family, and my inner circle of friends and allow them to literally own their own stuff uh, and we can do uh, uh, federate and back up on other people's servers, all that kind of thing. So I really hope Nextcloud keeps on moving on the right path. You know, I, I'm going to kind of change uh, topics here. Let's see. It's 1151 new life or death since to homes. I read this article and then uh, like a day later, I got an email from a friend saying that, you know, they lost an aunt and they don't know how long she was expired because she lived alone. Yeah. And I'll put it like this. Um, this was an article I believe I immediately shared with um, you and a couple people. And it's because like, um, you know, we used to have people who were going to tell us that you you know, government's going to barcode you. They're going to chip you. They're going to put a chip in your hand and follow you. Well, this is 2020. They didn't have to do that. All they had to do was to give us a sexy little rectangle of glass and we freely carry it around everywhere we go. So they have know where we're at already and everything. They don't need to chip us. Um, and what this guy said, uh, uh, who was at this conference from, I can't remember the name of the company, but it was a big one. Um, um, said, technology we're making, we're going to make in such a way you have to have it because quite literally what's more important, your health and your life and your friend's health and your friend's life or not having this software. What's more important to you, your personal privacy against everything or utter safety and security when it comes to your health. And it's like, when you actually read this whole article, it's really hard to argue. And the logic is what if I'm home alone and I fall? literally hit my head so hard. I literally pass out and I start to bleed out. Okay. If you have proper sensors in the house that he says can keep all of the data inside the house, make it all yours, keep it all private. 
but it can notice when an anonymously like that happens. It can then pipe over the inner speakers in the house door. Are you okay door? And when I don't say anything door, are you okay? And then when I don't say anything automatically call ambulance, the fire department or whatever to come to the house, that kind of technology, it's almost hard to fight against until you get to the point. Well, who else is going to have access to that data? Well, ultimately the government could. So I did one of the more less intelligent things I've done in a very long time. I went up the pull down attic stairs in flip flops and it's okay on the way up on the way down. It's not good. And I was home alone and I ended up upside down, smashing my head on the concrete with my legs through a, a different slot in the ladder. But, you know, I, I tucked my chin in so I didn't hit hard. I just, but it was enough like you jackass don't ever do that again. Yeah. I mean, now the logically, here's the thing. If this is a Chinese based company, if they go into China and put this into people's houses, a, they literally could make it so valuable because there are so many senior citizens over in China. It's insane. They could make it so valuable like that, that who in their right mind would say no to this. Okay. Then because China, China could then say, give me access to all that information. But here's the real thing. What would the government really get from 99.9999999% of all the installs? Nothing. Only that one little percent where they get anything where they find out someone is a literal um, 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 looking to defect and you know coming against the government. I would hope that when this kind of system could surface in other places, whether it's Sweden, Finland, UK, France, America, Canada, that there would be a little bit more focus on actually maintaining the data yourself and keeping certain people away from it. Um, I love the idea of having a system in my house looking out for me. But the old adage is what the kids in the city would say to the cops, you were put here to protect us, but who protects us from you? I, I, would, I, I love the idea of a system in my house helping protect me but who's going to protect me from it? Yep. So, yeah, I cannot find at least immediately the name of the company, but I know it was a company I never heard of. And when I went and looked at them up, they were actually really, really successful. Uh, and then I'm going to have to talk about 1152 just to, um, practice my nerdness because when i saw this thing like you know my like nerd twitch went off uh this is at cnx software this is the kind of link i want to make sure i go and i put into the chat so they can look at it uh mnt reform to open source dyi arm linux modular laptop coming soon crowdfunding just rolls off the tongue doesn't it okay just scroll down and then you scroll down a little bit more and then you see this laptop that literally looks like it's something from 1996. It's like an inch and a half thick. And listen, if you're buying a Linux arm modular lap, you cannot expect it to be sexy. You know, um, that kind of thing. I'll tell you what I liked about it is it's got eight batteries. I guess they're, what is it? The, what what is the standard battery that's in the Tesla? Uh, eighteen six fifty. Yeah, so it looks like eight eighteen six fifties, which is in, still I think smaller than your average laptop battery. I want to say they're like eight and twelve cells. Maybe. But I'll, I'll tell you what I love about that is everything you get now. The battery's built into it. It's you know a whole foobar situation to change out a battery. The, this looks like it's not glued in. I don't think it has welded tabs. It, it seriously looks like a bunch of AA batteries in a carrier. Well, because that's almost what it is. Um, I will not, I'm really not going to try to sound re re ridiculous with this, but I have been waiting for a true modular laptop since 94 or something. I mean, I don't understand why in the hell we're still waiting on this. 
I want to be able, because here's the whole logic. I love the idea and without sounding dumb, man, sustainability. If I can buy one housing and then in a year upgrade one part and then two years upgrade another part and then four years upgrade another part, I don't have to keep buying entire units again. Okay. I love the idea. And, um, especially arm based because without sounding dumb, the arm based stuff is only going to grow exponentially faster where the Intel stuff, it's basically leaked. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the next, uh, 11 years worth of development for Intel, all the documents got leaked. We know exactly what their path is, what their plan is, what they are going to have. Um, I still think arm is going to do more than Intel in, in that same time period. Yeah, I like to look at this, even though it's gigantic. I like it, not quite for me, but I, I do like it. I, I think this, it, and this is one of these things where I hope there's competition to, you know, breed a better product. And see, I don't know about you, Rich. I've never seen any piece of hardware in my life with as many bullet points as this thing. I mean, typically you go and look at a piece of hardware and it might have 12 bullet points. You know, processor, RAM, display resolution, frequency, ports, you know, IO, battery life. This thing has what looks like a hundred and like twenty different bullet points kind of thing, because that's how much fine grain detail they explain. Because for the, the longest time when you went to buy a computer or a laptop, you really never what the bus speed was, for instance, unless you literally researched what was the motherboard and then go found out yourself these kind of little details. Okay, um, wait, wait, wait. I, I got a hit on this one here. So it says expansion slots, M2, so yeah, NVMe SSD, right? MPCIe slot for a Wi-Fi card, an embedded graphics card, FPG board, etc. I'm like, well, cool. Yeah, FPGA kind of thing. And the... um. Yeah, the PCI one, that's like, isn't that the old school, uh, like credit card slot in laptops? I think so. I thought it was MCPIE. I can't remember, but, um, MPC, yeah, I believe you're right. Yeah. Um, um, uh, it was, we, we called it something express. Yeah. Right. Very cool. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing where I honestly, I think, you know, there's no way I'm getting one. There's no way you're getting one. We're not going to know anybody who's going to get one, but just the fact that it's available. I like the idea. And we still have like 60 links, seems like. Um, we got a new Intel Phantom Canyon Nux coming. Uh, if you like the idea of having like uh, smaller form factor computers and you want to do at least some light to moderate gaming, line up 1152 in the notes. Uh, this is the gaming Nux that they came out with, I want to say last year, maybe a year and a half ago, where they just did like a big update to it where it's running a Tiger Lake CPU and a XE GPU, which I don't even know what the hell that is, but I'm thinking that's like the predecessor to the dedicated Intel discrete graphics card. Um, this might be like their beta version of it. Okay, can I ask, in the links you have Nook 10, Nook 11, where did the Nook 9 go? Is there a Nook 9? Maybe 9 was an unlucky number, I don't know. Because... Uh, I think I got a Nook 6, and the Nook 7s came out, Nook 8s, and uh, I'm a little shocked. Well, I think they actually now own three, if not four, versions of the Nooks, and they just keep revving. They, they rev one um, until it's, like, dead, and it takes, like, three years for it to rev and die kind of thing, I think. So... Um, like this phantom is in, I think the second or third rev. Okay. So I have a Nook six. I'm looking on Amazon right now. I see Nook eights and Nook sevens actually in Nook sixes. But I, I don't see a Nook nine. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, also, I'll say I've been looking and I haven't heard anything on the Lenovo single board computer, which I expect to hear really soon. Um, but here's one, Rich. This to me is when we're literally talking sci fi future tech. 1162. Okay, now we're going to take a small little mini tangent and it's the world of conspiracy theories. Okay, long story short, there's been conspiracy theories now for a long time that say we don't need nuclear, we don't need wind, we don't need coal, we don't need any of these kind of powers because we can pull all the power we want out of thin air. Okay. The long and the short of it is, yes, there's basically radiation, there's radio waves through the air that if you put the right thing together, you will get energy out of it, but you'll get so little energy out of it, they basically, there's nothing you can do with it. I need a crystal radio kit and hand it to my daughter and freak her out. Yeah, exactly. Right. They would literally think it's voodoo kind of thing. Um, But here's the dirty secret. One more thing. I'm sorry to interrupt you. She, when she heard about TV antennas, she's like, is that legal? You don't have to pay for TV service? Yeah. I hate to say I understand, but yeah, it, it is completely foreign to them. But yeah, like, the truth is, I mean, if you take a look at the computer chip history evolution, okay? Everything is becoming unbelievably smaller. Everything is giving off tons less heat. Everything is becoming much more efficient with energy as well. Electricity. Okay. So here is the next stage of development. Okay. Onion Zero, which I do believe O-N-I-O, I I believe it was somebody we saw on Kickstarter like a year ago, offering a small modular computer, which could do a whole bunch of different stuff, a whole bunch of different components for different functionality. Well, O-N-I-O dot zero offers a risk v microcontroller that runs without a battery. It basically doesn't run off of anything if I read this right. You literally just set the chip down and out of thin air, the chip basically can do enough work to do stuff. I'm sure it, you know, even to compute your like checkbook. It would take a month, but at least it can do something. Yeah. I'm just going to say that's what I, how I read it. I could be completely wrong. But this is like, to me, really interesting. And this is where the conspiracy theorists will say, see, I told you we don't need nuclear power. Well, I, I understand the whole, you know, sucking power off of RF because it takes power to make the RF, whether it's Wi-Fi, whatever it may be. But the question is, what do you do with it when you got it? Does it have enough power to communicate on Wi-Fi or not? Which it probably does not. No, I would guess literally after sitting there for two hours, it might be able to give you a blip, like 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 two bits worth of data over wi-fi kind of thing because it literally is that hard to pull energy out of quote-unquote thin air but you know this is the kind of thing where why not have a device unplugged just sitting back in an emergency type situation that when it gets triggered can save up you know two months worth of energy and then shoot out a response or something okay so it says key specifications i'm looking at the product page from their website uh crystalless btle transmitter programmable output power to minus 40 to 0 db blah three and a half to 10 gigahertz optional 433 megahertz pretty cool yeah and and this is going to be one of those extremely insanely hyper focused things it will only be able to do a very small set number of things, but just the fact that it's possible, it, it, this is the kind of thing, literally, I hate to say this, in like five to 20 years is where we're going to see significant advancement in this kind of thing. It's not going to be in a year or two. Um, I, I just thought it was interesting and thought I'd bring it because it, it's technically a mini computer. 
Well, you know, that, that's kind of interesting because one of the things I've been wanting to do is, uh, what is it, Dallas Semiconductor, which is now microchip, I guess. They have the 1821, which is a one-wire temperature sensor. No, like, oh, I got to run wires, even though it's, well, they say one wire, it's two wires. There's a uh, power and a ground, basically. Like, well, if you had this, all you would have to do is sprinkle the chips wherever you want to monitor temperature. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I'm pretty sure we, you, we, we've heard in the past of ECS, Rich, um, I believe they were like a hardware um, motherboard manufacturer, I believe. Line uh, 1162 in the notes. Nope, sorry. 1159 in the notes. Uh, ESC unveils Leva Q1 palm-sized PC with dual display or Ethernet ports. So it's literally like half of half it's like a quarter of the size of an intel NUC, maybe just a touch bigger than a quarter so it's literally a palm top computer with dual video output and it says it comes in the uh a um a um a apollo lake celeron n3500 celeron 3450 or a pentium n4200 which is none of it is high end not supposed to be high end just so it's supposed to work and it has up to four gig of ram up to 64 gig of emmc this literally could be the small office computer super small form factor especially if it's affordable where you could literally give it to someone and not worry about it literally failing it probably would cost more to insure it than to just go buy a brand new one yeah i'm looking for a price i don't see a price uh, but but that's definitely kind of a niche market and it could be really good i mean this is like the original upboard uh because i'm pretty sure that's the same processor the pentium n4200 that i had on the original upboard definitely sounds right uh it says it is 2.9 inch by 2.9 inch by 1.4 inch which is really tiny uh it does say that they um previously announced leva z3 plus and leva z3 e plus with 10 with 10th generation intel core comet lake chips um so they're definitely putting out more than just a couple of these mini computers which i think is cool the more the merrier So I clicked through to their website. I'm not sure what it is. It says motherboard, notebook, tablet, system, IPC, IoT. Oh, I can hover over it. Here it is. I would guess it's under system. All right. So they're not giving you a price yet. Yeah, it it, it wouldn't shock me. It's going to take uh, weeks, if not longer, for them to get everything like hammered out is what I'm going to say. Um, this one I'm going to bring up, even though I don't really like what Microsoft is doing, but I will say Microsoft announced in partnership with, I want to say it was HP at CES, a arm laptop that had a 24 hour battery. Okay. Here's another one. Um, Microsoft introduces two new arm powered 4g enabled laptops for education, starting at $299. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. Which and, means in a year, it'll be 200 bucks. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you remember rich, we all remember the complete debacle of windows RT, which was their arm based windows eight, maybe devices where nothing ran on it. Uh, you had to only install from the windows store and you only had a subset of things you could put on it. And like really quickly when they came out and being sold, they died like incredibly quickly. When I hear RT, I think Russia today. What are we talking about? I don't know why it was called RT, but yeah, that's what it's called, RT. Real but, um, time? What was that? I, I can't remember, but I know it was ARM-based. And here's the thing. I believe now what they're doing is because literally two years, ARM processors have gotten probably like four times more powerful kind of thing um, with the high-end stuff like the uh, um, Qualcomm and stuff chips. 
and Ram has shot down in price so much more. What I believe now they're doing on ARM boards, Microsoft, I believe they're literally emulating everything that's not ARM. So you will be able to run, in air quotes, everything you can normally run on your normal computer on a Microsoft ARM computer. It just might be a touch slower. Well, you know, slower. So, you know, I like the fact that we have companies pushing Microsoft in so many directions. They're offering, you know, high end surface pro devices, which are genuinely high end. And then they're also going to be offering these low end arm based education laptops for 299 bucks. That's good. So also along with that, uh, you know, Apple's including ARM processors in their newer machines, so we may see an ARM future. That's very interesting. Well, and, you know, Intel will still be around. The only question will be is where will Intel get most of its, uh, you know, profit from? Um, and, th and that's where I have no idea. All right, Rich, uh, I think we've been going for more than an hour. I got to uh, get this thing wrapped up and get ready for four hours of training tomorrow. I think you're muted. I clicked in the wrong place. Uh, I was going to say one more link, the th but we could always save it for next week. No, no, go ahead. So, I'm not sure what line it is. I know I saw it on CNX software. It was the $35 router. We were talking about that, I think, yesterday. So Aha. Uh -huh. Well, and here's like, oh man, I hate to say it like this. There's a reason why this router is 35 bucks okay uh show me redmi is a well-known popular brand of phone uh, over there in uh asia uh really competent really well known this is a ac uh 2100 router sells for 35 dollars and up so they have multiple different versions of it the lowest one is 35 bucks um and here's i think part of the reason now, economist, futurist, people involved with the business of computing is saying we are now starting to begin the experience of the death of Wi-Fi. They say in three to five years, there will be no such thing as Wi-Fi. Nobody will have a Wi-Fi router and no place will offer Wi-Fi and no device being sold will have a Wi-Fi uh, chip on it. Because we're all going to be 5G. Because we're all going to be well there, China is already having multiple conferences and meetings on 6G. So, you know, why wait? I don't know who's right. I will say this. I think prime time to buy a Wi-Fi router will be in 2020 sometime. So uh, I encourage everyone to keep your eyes open for affordable routers with multiple antennas with, um, uh, you know, multiple band support is the logic especially if it's mimo i think it is uh where it's the multiple in multiple out kind of thing um and of course uh the dual band is is good as well 2.4 and 5 so if you're close everything will go super fast and if you're not close you'll at least get connectivity uh but this is a 35 dollar router which i'm sure last year would have been 85 dollars and then as you step up in range, I think the prices go all the way up to, I want to say it was $90, which still was a very fair price as far as I was concerned. And I, I clicked through to the link. So the one important thing is it runs OpenWRT. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, um, I have an Asus router that's a real decent Asus router, which is based on, I think it's DDWRT. OpenRT and DDWRT. Uh, WRT are forks and it's a really good router operating system. Oh yeah. Um, open gargle, open wart. Uh, there's like three or four of them that are just unbelievably 
solid as one would say and they're the ones that first were enabling you to do very much enterprise like stuff on your home network like qos uh like saying my child's tablet at most will get 20 percent of the bandwidth let's leave some for dad kind of thing um and yeah right now it looks like you can go to aliexpress and it looks like you can buy uh one of these things which i will say again um it's just like anything else if you're shopping on ebay if you're shopping on AliExpress, if you're slopping on Swappa, or you're shopping on Amazon and it's not been coming from Amazon, read the person you're buying it from. Look at how many sales they have. Look at their reviews before pulling the trigger kind of thing. Um, even though I'm sure this is going to be a per perfectly safe sale, you got to do your due diligence and at least look at it. And I will say this guy, Jean-Luc uh, Franck, whatever, uh, I, the, he is the reason why I miss Google plus because he was on Google plus and this guy would literally post like 40 things a day. And some of them were fantastic. Yeah. I realized I, today I had, well, Oh, I wish I could post it. Oh uh, yeah. There's no Google plus that allows me to, you know, post a link, have an image and, you know, to talk about it and get other people's feedback. Uh, yeah, I do miss Google plus. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I kind of miss the uh, people on Google+. Plus. I don't mind, mm -hmm. you know, saying that out loud. Okay, Rich, uh, what's the easiest way for people to uh, catch up with you? Uh, flyingrich.com or just Flying Rich No Space on YouTube. You can see my tech videos out there. And uh, there's always a contact page on uh, flyingrich.com. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for coming out live. I want to thank uh, Jonas, John, Red, Anthony, another John Miller, John B and John Miller. Thank you guys much for coming out. Uh, Jonas, you're the man. I miss hanging with you, man. Um, last Friday, I was under obligations kind of thing. Got to keep people happy. Um, but do not forget, if you want to keep me happy uh, and you want this show completely ad free, unlike, you know, all the ads you had to sit through on, on, on on this show, if they made you sick to your stomach, you too can go to patreon.com slash the mini PC show, become a active Patreon supporter. And you don't have to worry about all the ads. Um, all the links will be in the notes, whether you want to join us on discord, Twitter, Facebook matter most, uh, or any place else. If you follow us on YouTube, uh, you can then subscribe, uh, hit the like button, hit the bell button, hit all those buttons, buttons, buttons. And then you can know when we go live, or you can literally just say, Hey door, Hit me up when you go live. I don't mind it. Um, with that, uh, do not forget, if you want to come around to a place where we have big talk about little machines, it's a mini PC show. Hopefully, we'll talk to everyone again in about a week. Okay. Da dang, dang, dang. Stop the recording. Close. Stop the recording and close. So the Banggood link was too long for the chat. Ha ha. Ha ha. Wow. Can't say I've seen that before. Man. Oh my goodness. So I was searching for mesh in the description, and it said it's there, but I can't find it. Okay, so let me see if this is too long. There you go. The link worked for me. Uh-huh. I just took out the garbage at the end. The garbage. Whatever they're using to attract me. Basically, yeah. But you know, it's like it's what everyone does. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness! I got a puffy bird staring at me, like I <laughs> owe him a petting. Okay, let me do this real quick. Yeah, I, 
I still, uh, let's see, I, I'm rocking the Asus router and the hacked uh, T-Mobile router, and I, I want to get another T-Mobile router just so I have a backup in case I break something. Right. Yeah, my router, I want to say, is eight years old? Seven years old? It's, it is old. Yeah, my, my router is more than five years old. Mine's a TP-Link N750. Uh, Jonas is saying if my bird can crack macadamia nuts, he'd send him some. But uh, yeah, nah, he's he's a Quaker parakeet, so he's not that big. And actually, I'm growing... I've got a macadamia tree a friend gave me. But it's probably still a couple years away from maturity. Oh, Jonas, uh, do you have dragon fruit uh, anywhere near you? Because I'm growing dragon fruit. Okay, so let me do this. And I just did a backup of my uh, next cloud. I like the fact yeah, that I'm in, in the. Uh, I mean, good. Yeah, we're we're talking recently, and uh, you were asking about uh, Diet Pie update. And I updated Diet Pie at home, and I got Next Cloud running at home. I'm wondering if I got all sorts of other stuff going on. I don't know, but I know I can't update my Diet Pie. It's been like a week now. Yeah, I, I like the fact that the um, NextCloud uh, NCP panel, the admin panel, right there, I can just you know, do all my admin type functions. And I like the fact that it lets me point the backup directory to a different place. So I literally have it backed up off of the internal hard drive SD card to my external hard drive, uh, USB drive. I don't want it auto backup though. You know what I mean? Because I, I I don't care about the data on it as much as I care about just the config. Because I don't want to tell people, oh, here's your new username and password again. Oh, I gotta visit Jonas. He says the brewery across the street from his office makes dragon fruit cider. Huh. That could be really interesting. And by interesting, I mean delicious. Good night, John. Take it easy, John. Uh, brain, 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 hurting, 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 brain, brain. <laughs> All right. So that's interesting. Jonas is saying you can't even take fruit on the plane. So it's like yeah. he's telling me this dragon fruit blah, blah. I'm like, dude, send me some. Because I, I was just doing uh, grafting. I grafted 11 dragon fruit seedlings this weekend. And of course, today it was like 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Hence the fleece here, which it was colder in Orlando. Right. Okay. Bang, bang. Bang, bang. The, the other problem with dragon fruit is seedlings, you know, they won't mature for years. But if you yeah, like take... Three years? Uh, yeah, it's probably in that area. I didn't realize you knew so much about dragon fruit. So... I've got uh, Vietnamese White and American Beauty, uh, but I also grafted a whole bunch of the yellow onto some of the mature stock that I have. <laughs> Jonas says it's 85, 90 degrees, suckers. I'm sure it is. Um, yeah, man, I heard about the Honolulu thing last week. Was it Honolulu? Whatever, the cops, man, that was not cool. The crazy guy was getting evicted. I want to say the crazy guy was getting evicted. He didn't want to get evicted. So he stabbed two people, three people, oh. set the house on fire. Oh, and wow. then I believe he shot two sheriffs, cops. Where, where do you get a gun in Hawaii? Well, from Hawaii. I mean, you can get guns in Hawaii. Yeah, they're, they're pretty tight on everything in Hawaii. You can get them. <laughs> Joe, this is funny. He says, I have an extra room, but you have to stay for two weeks. One week will just make you sad. Yeah, my one buddy said uh, it took a while for him to turn around and say, yeah, I think I got to go home. Kona guns and ammo. I got to look them up. Yeah. Wow, Rich, there's a lot of red there on your audio. 
That's oh no, I'm peeking. That's a lot of red. Crap. Well, I mean, it didn't sound, I didn't notice, I'll just say this. I don't always notice stuff live. That's the caveat. But I didn't mm -hmm. notice a lot of distortion in your voice. So I don't think you have to really worry about it per se. But I will say next time we can maybe turn it down a notch. The, 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 uh, you know what I mean, the gain. We are the island's largest guns and ammo supply store. We stock over 300 guns and literally tons of ammo. Tuesday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. They need a better website. Well, it's not if they don't have a lot of competition. They sure don't. Yeah, I shared a thing with Tracy last week. I said, I really wish I had more money and more time. It was an article all about the history and the types of stouts and then how you can make your own stout. It's like, you know, I don't have the time, the money, or the patience really to do that. Mm. Oh man. Training's gonna kill me tomorrow. Yeah, and I'll say this uh transcoding that's going on to my computer. And it's funny, I was talking to a co-worker. He has pineapples on his property. There, there was a pineapple growing where I stay here in Orlando, and uh, squirrels got to it and ate it. So uh. the, they say you got to put, like, uh, ivory soap shavings in, in the ground around it, and that keeps huh. pests away. And something has been chomping on my dragon fruit seedlings. I don't know if it's geckos, but I've been spraying them with neem, N-E-E-M, oil. Nah, Jonas said they use a lot of neem oil there. Yeah, I, I got an acre and a quarter, and uh, but there's like one corner of the property is all like scraggly pine trees, uh, so I I don't have a lot of area that gets full sun. Um, so I got to be kind of picky where I plant things. Yeah, and of course, the front yard, there's a large area that gets full sun, but I, I think I'd look way too redneck having, you know, dragon fruit growing in my front yard. If that or my wife would tell me how that would be wrong. See now, Rich, now do you, do you see that audio? Okay, I'm looking. Okay, do you see how, like, it isn't, like, insanely red? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that... So I, at least, oh, I'll say this, I had the advantage of consistency. You know what I mean? I'm always on the same yeah, rig with the same sorry. this thing that. Yeah, I mean, it's just the kind of thing. It's just, you know, I just ask that we, we try to get you good hardware, then not switch it unless we have to. So when we get it toned in, you know, tuned mm -hmm. in, then it's less, 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 less to even think about. Yep. But, but here's, here's the gimmick. Mumble, Mumble does I hate the fact that mumble messes with the audio. Um, it oh, does, the audio input, right? It well, it, it does compression, it does EQing, it does toning, and it does lossless things to files. But with all that said, sometimes the things they do to a file literally saves the file from being garbage. So I'm 99% sure, even though you were high. You were hot a whole bunch. I don't think anyone who downloads the post content will be able to tell. And that's why I still right. use Mumble. And I have no problem saying I am 99.999% sure I was the first podcast out there to use Mumble for podcasting uh, purposes just because it made sense. It was a pain in the ass. Sorry, paying the butt to get set up back in the day. But once you had it set up, it just worked. Even on RPM-based distros. Now? I can't tell. It sounded fine to me before. Oh, okay. 
mean, if you hit audacity and hit record, you'll be able to see your, uh, waveform. Yeah. I don't have audacity on my Chromebook. Mm. All right. So Swift says he's Keep originally it. from DC. Where is he now? Right in Baltimore. Oh, Baltimore. Oh, he's okay. in Beemore. So, um, no, not all cats planet. I was at least four years before them, at least four years before them. In in Florida, the Publix uh, have dragon fruit, but that doesn't help you because I'm sure there's no Publix in DC. But uh, Whole Foods I've seen have dragon fruit. Um, I want to say honestly, I want to say Redner's. Um, Lennox Cranks was like four years, five years after Lennox Basics. Yeah. Um, Redner's is just a like a little chain of supermarkets. Sometimes I go in there, I see star fruit and dragon fruit, which shocks me. Yeah, so, I mean, you can Google pictures and videos, and, and there's this one guy, Grafting Dragon Fruit, has a YouTube channel, uh, and he's got a lot of inform information on it, uh, and I, I follow him. I don't think I've ever ate dragon fruit. I want to say I drank, like, the wife had, like, dragon fruit mixed cocktails kind of thing. Yeah, which that just has the dragon fruit name on it and probably yeah, yeah, yeah. a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, flavors. I keep forgetting what I did. Okay, so now we come over here, load up Q Tractor, which I will say Q Tractor is gold. And to not use Q, Q, Q Tractor means you like doing pointless, repetitive work because it's that damn good of a tool. Now, this I did pick up straight from Klaatu, and I want to say he talked about it first on Colonel Panic. It may, may, might have been Colonel Panic was the first place I heard him talk about this. Because I don't think it was Bad Apples, which was his first podcast. Yeah, because I remember trying to, I remember convincing, I, I thought it was Peter 64 to use Mumble. Because they were using asterisks, you know, garbage stuff, ju ju just like tilts. They were using asterisks. <laughs> and they were wondering why they kept having problems like every week. You know, people were having, well, it worked last week, kind of thing. Okay, let me see. Ah, forgot. Yeah, I believe we used Astros for one week. After one week, I said, I'm never using it again. It's garbage. Yeah, sip. Sip. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. Haven't heard of tilts in years. Oh, ouch. Oh, wow. Ugh, that, that cuts deep there. Nah. Well, good for... No, never mind. <laughs> well, look on the bright side. He, he hasn't had to listen to Joel. You know, the guy just died today from Monty Python. Oh, no, not the Monty Python guy. Yeah, so always look on the bright side of life. <laughs> Let's go like this. I'm going to trim that up more. And the best thing about using Mumble is it doesn't matter when someone comes into the show, their files all begin at the same spot, and you never have to worry about lining up stuff in the beginning. Oh, I, I thought when you did the multi-channel recording with Mumble that uh, the files weren't lined up. No, they're always perfectly lined up. Unless oh. you have a blabbermouth who won't stop talking for more than eight minutes. Key. Oh, jeez. You know, if you have a blabbermouth who won't stop talking for over eight minutes and 30 seconds, because I've actually tested this and I've told them this, but who listens to me? If you oh, go I, for I make more sure than, I... Right, you just de-key for a second and then it's all fine. But if you don't de-key and you go for all the length of time, it blows everyone's time sync off. And then it'll be anywhere from a second to like a three and a half second jump. So if you have a blabber mouth on the show, then you got to check the beginning, check the end of the file. And if it doesn't match up, then you got to, you know, go find where the time skip happened. But it is so, a pain to find. Anything I say from now on, is that going to be recorded in perpetuity on the uh, YouTube stream? It's or do you edit that? It's, I don't edit YouTube. I don't got time for that. Oh, okay. All right. So I won't say anything bad right now. Okay. Okay, go with this. Because, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing about m m Mumble. It ain't perfect. You got to know the l limitations. You know, like when I get a brand new car to me, 
first thing I do is I go take it to an open parking lot and I literally slam the gas and slam the brakes as hard as I can and try to see if I can make it, you know, spin out a little bit just to know what can I do? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when you get married, the first thing you do is you see how far you can, you know, you know, <laughs> And here's the time-consuming part of the entire process, which this, we were on for an hour and 12 minutes, basically. So this is going to be at least a three and a half minute process, where before this was literally a 20 plus minute process. And what is that, the down mix or? Uh, This is the transcoding of taking all the intro music, outro music, and both of our tracks, and it's compressing them. It's doing noise cancellation, EQing. It's doing hard compression, and then it's doing what's called, oh, man, um, limiting. Okay. So it's literally, if you know the width of the whole waveform is one inch, it sets hard limits at, like, you know, with, with like uh, a sixteenth on the top and a sixteenth on the bottom, where it cannot go past that part, so you can't peak. Once you know, get into here, so it will push it as hard as it can to be that hard level, and then not go past it, kind of thing. The limiter is the one thing I don't know how you can do in Audacity, which is why sometimes when you listen to some shows, you can definitely tell when they don't do that kind of hard limiting and you hear people do this kind of thing where their audio fades in and out it's because they're not doing the compression plus the hard limiting and you're running this on intel yes yeah, an intel um it's a i want to say if we're at the 10th gen computer this is an eighth gen i7 that was just given to me last year hp uh laptop um and it just runs <laughs> At least three times faster than my previous desktop. At least three times faster. Oh, wow. That's a big deal. Yeah. And the thing is, it has 16 gigs of RAM, just like my desktop. Um, It just, the processor helps that much. And I'm sure the processor has better supported uh, what's called VT, V-Sync, V-something in the BIOS. Mm -hmm. Can't remember what it's called. Yeah, Jupiter Broadcasting. You got on Jupiter Broadcasting back in 2010. I want to say that was just about the time I started to listen to them. And then very quickly after that, I was sick to my stomach. You know. But honestly, that time, I really am happy for Chris. Chris got exactly what he wanted, money. Because <laughs> that's all he ever wanted. You know, he didn't hide that either. He got exactly what he wanted. Um, Linux Academy, I don't know if he's good for Linux Academy. I don't know if Linux Academy is good for him, to be honest, but he got money. And it's like, if my job involved Linux at all, I would have been trying to get my, um, training through them just to support the freaking small guy. Well, what's Chris Fisher doing now? He's, he's where's he with the Linux a um a um a academy basically bought him out and he's making content for them basically because so i've seen some i think youtube videos with him yeah i don't know but i will say swift says he used to like the linux action show so you didn't like the windows action show swift because uh, when they had that i thought you know what the hell is this it's got that action bad. in the name. It's got to be good. Well, that to me was just like, you know, it's like you and the car, the like premium edition or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like that word's a setup. And I love the fact, I'll say it like this. I love the fact that little scoundry, scummy people who are associated with them now have a podcast called Lennox for Everyone. It's like, yeah, uh-huh. wow. Trying to get the rub, trying desperately to get the rub. You know, and it's just funny. Just funny is what I'll say. But, you know, and they literally, at, in one place, say FOR, 
Linux for everyone. And then other places, they say Linux, the number for everyone. So they don't even understand how SEO works, you know, which is okay. Oh. Yeah, I'll say the, the, the worst thing about the Linux Action Show was that they taught people that arguing and saying controversial things would draw people in and draw numbers. So people think that, you know, well, the bigger of a jerk I am, the more downloads I'm going to get, which mm -hmm. is not the case at all. But that's what that taught a certain class of podcasters where you had other people like um, Lennox Reality, which to me was far more successful than the Lennox Action Show, but it didn't teach people to just be nice and, you know, tell the truth and people will listen. Chess Griffin. Uh, if, 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 if I could be compared to anybody in the podcasting world, I would take it as a compliment. It would be Chess Griffin. Cause like he wasn't mean to anybody about anything. He didn't argue about anything. He didn't say things knowing it was controversial and knowing that it would drive people to send emails in. Cause that's what I remember Lunduk used to do all the time. He used to say stuff and then laugh about it the following week. Alrighty. I think I got to call it a night. I just got to finish this, which I'm already close to doing. Right, everybody. And everybody in the, the YouTube chat. Good night, guys. And I remember, I, and I do remember, I do remember Swift emailing them with very honestly saying, you keep saying how you don't run on a complete Linux workflow. Okay. Can I ask what parts are not using Linux? And can I ask, can I try to help you find solutions in Linux that can do what you need to do. Didn't even get an email back. And after that, I know I, I emailed them at least five times at, at, after that, literally just, you know, with questions and compliments about things, never once got any feedback back to them once. And, you know, if a podcast doesn't take the time to at least once in a while reply back and say, hello, it's like, I don't understand why you, I, don't, I didn't understand why you podcasted, but then he made a lot of money. So I guess I understand why. You know, we all got to do their things. Yes, I do agree. He was, um, I don't know if he was a jerk to Noah or he was just a jerk like with Noah. I don't know if he thought again, it would dry ratings or stuff, but yes, I do agree. When he was on, I, I would literally feel sorry for Noah, him and the, um, the BSD guy. That BSD guy, I can't remember his name. He has his own stuff too. He insane smart. That BSD guy, I, he he was the guy. I kept thinking, you know, why isn't he working for a huge conglomerate company, writing really tight drivers for software? Because he was that damn smart. Oh man, can't remember his name. I don't know. I don't know how long he was around. Now that I say that out loud. So let's go like this. Say stop sharing. Now my camera's gonna go crazy. So let me come here, get the white balance back, and there you go. Yeah, that color difference almost makes me sick to my stomach. Because it's so, that, that orange. Okay, so let me come here, push that there, come here, launch my Nautilus. And I do got to get just better about emails. I know there was at least one there that I forgot to say. This was 104. I know I always say I got to get better with emails, but apparently I never do get better with my emails. Okay. Show title. Here's where I suck. I completely suck at show titles. Okay. Click this. Okay, so come all the way down. 
click this, click that, copy, come to sheet two. Bang. This is going to be one of four. Paste one of four. Got to do some text file manipulation. Okay, now, yeah, 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 yeah. Got to go back and fix the other notes. So we do not forget what we talked about. And then mark the spreadsheet so we know we're next shows links begin butter okay uh, let me do this leave. I can't do that anymore yeah okay now uh, come back here copy this for the notes bang I did have two people ask me about starting up a pine cast and it's like, I don't know if there's enough stuff to do a podcast just about pine products. But then worst case scenario, what happens if they go belly up? You know? Uh, control Z. Let me try that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're first going to turn that into that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, but I could see doing like, um, cause it can't be a full, uh, uh, like podcast if I do a pine cast, cause literally only like once a month do they put out like true updates. Uh, and then when they do, it's really, uh, dry is what I'll say. Uh, mini PC. I can't even spell right. I do miss the pie cast too. I will. I, there's a couple pie related uh podcast that just completely disappeared and i had no idea why it made no sense to me because <laughs> raspberry pi is successful maybe there wasn't enough uh drive for marketing or something i don't know yeah that's why i'm happy to say the mini pc show i'm pretty sure has been going on longer than most mini related things is what I want to say. Okay. There you go. I am blind. Control K, enter. Control K, enter. Control, oh, Control K, enter. Control K, enter. Control K, enter. I got to go get gas in the car. Do not have enough gas to get to work tomorrow. And I do believe Rotho is the cheapest right now. Okay, now the one thing I also got to do is I got to make sure that the link in the top is correct. Weird. Let me go like this. Actually, let me control C the whole thing. Control V the whole thing. Now let me come back here to the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edit. Bang, 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 bang. Got that one now. Got to make sure the Discord. That's not right. Control K, enter. Okay, now, Control C, that's right. Fix the YouTube links too, buddy. Good job. I actually did that right for a change. Okay, now, show titles. Episode 104. We had new Patreon people, and we talked about Pine Phone, cloud based test farm, which I find very interesting. 
Edge AI server, NextCloud hub, new life or death sensors, open source modular ARM laptop, Intel Nux, Intel Nux, ONIO0, ECS Palm Tops, Microsoft 4G laptops, and Show Me Redmi Router. Huh. Don't know to do 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 to do. Yeah, I was honestly thinking about the um doing like a a forum, basically just the hot forum threads and just literally call them off. Um, hmm. Okay, show one hundred four. Got to talk about next cloud hub because that's uh you know SEOable. Next cloud is it all one word? I don't think they do it all one word. Nope, two words. Next cloud hub. I'm going to say mod dealer D U L A R laptop modular arm laptop and cloud based test farm. I like the idea of that. So I'm going to have that in there too. Yeah, that's good enough. Bang. That's what I'm thinking. Okay, so let me come over here to the ID3 data. Control C. 104. Podcast. Zero. Composer. URL. Images. Add. MPC 3000. Over 3000. FileZilla. Tried. Trustworthy. FileZilla. Which I'm really kind of shocked. Still use FileZilla. I mean, it works. It just works. Mini 104. Uploading. I'm just happy I don't use normal FTP anymore. I think I got off that too late. I want to say it was like 2012. I had no idea back then that everything in FTP was transferred in literal clear text. I don't know how. How everyone in the world didn't get hacked. Okay, 104. I'm going to publish it right now. And then the question is, is why don't we be nice to the Patreoners and give them... Uh, part of me is tempted to say, maybe I should record the show, publish, um, post produce the show and then post it to the Patreon people. And then like hours later, post it publicly. You know what I mean? I'm honestly okay. If they get early access to stuff. Yeah. I I, I don't know why I wouldn't be okay with that. Is You know, I, I feel like saying out loud to at least myself. Uh, so let's just go to the root of here. And I got to stop the local video recording before it fell to my hard drive. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did. Okay, good. Even. Uh, mini 104. Uh, refresh. Yeah, there you go. Mini 104. Control C. Control V. Okay, do I need the artwork too? Uh, da, 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 two, three, uh, seven, uh, public audio. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's go like that. Let's copy that one piece of artwork up, which should be mini 720. Can't use a 3000 anywhere else except there. So once again, refresh, Badang. Actually, I should already have that. What am I doing? Yeah, delete. So I don't need that there. Okay, so let's go back up to the Patreon. Select audio. Yep. 
select optional artwork. We're going to go next cloud to DDG and website images. Mini. Okay, now I need the actual. Yeah, I got it right here. The full text description. I love tab completion. Um, the one reason I would be okay with using Linux at work without sounding, oh man. Um, the reason I am okay with using Windows at work is because it requires no thought. Uh, you really can suffer like brain damage and still administrate <laughs> Windows stuff really without thinking. Um, Tab completion enables me to do a lot of things without thinking, is what I'm going to say. I am going to do... No, I'm not going to do early access. Let's do that. Okay. So now it's also post to the Patreon, which now I'm going to try every week to remember to also post there. So if you guys want to subscribe there, you can. I don't want to force anybody to subscribe where they're not comfortable with the logic. Okay, so that's that. That's that. Let me close this. I did get it. At least one email during the show. Um, Google Play. Google January Google Payments account balance. What? Huh? Something new. Sure, and I click on the link in the note though. That's the thing. I'm really happy that uh, we did a thing at work. They thought like, you know, we're all stupid. They did a thing at work where they started to purposely send planned phishing emails out with links that if you clicked them, the security team was then going to know that you clicked them. And the one guy was shocked when he said, I had a 0% <laughs> rate. And I'm like, uh, duh. <laughs> I said, look, to click bad links in emails first means you have to open up emails. I don't. He said, what do you mean? I said, I look at the person who it's coming from. I look at the subject line. I look at the two line, three line preview, and I can tell if it's an email that is actually for me. And if it's actually for me, I open it. And if it's not, I just delete it. And he said, well, what if it was important? I said, well, they'll send it again, or they'll call me up, or they'll stop by my desk, or they'll do all three. So no, I, I don't just randomly open emails. Couldn't believe it. Oh. Okay, guys. Definitely thank you guys for coming out. I <laughs> thank, thank you guys for hanging out and see Highlander trolling you, Swift. Um, what ads are you running? I'm not running any ads. That's the whole thing. I'm not running any ads at all, anywhere. But I keep saying if you want to add free show, you know, you can join us on Patreon just to see if anyone even notices. Because I've noticed more than a couple of podcasts literally do both. Take ads and Patreon and then say, well, if you want ad free, go to Patreon. And I'm like, why can't you just do one or the other? Um, I just don't get it. Well, you know, I'll just say this, um, Jonas, they, without sounding, you know, they don't push me around at work too much. Uh, I think they're actually starting to understand that I know stuff. Oh, uh, you know, like the midget on Game of Thrones says, I drink and know things. I just know things. I don't drink at work. Um, and I think they're starting to realize that um, a couple of people have been let go when they didn't document anything. And I was able to basically pick up everything they did and, and keep things going. Amigos Gaming does Spotify now. Spotify, I don't know if you can do Spotify. I thought you had to be invited into Spotify. And I did publish this, right? Did I? Wait a minute. Yeah, okay, I, I, I did. Um, I thought with Spotify, you had to be invited to be on the network. Uh, I do have to do my weekly report, though. But I have to do my weekly report on Thursday. If that makes any sense to anybody, you're on narcotics. Weekly reports should not be on Thursday. Um, submit Spotify podcast. 
Maybe I am on Spotify. Okay. Let me see. Uh, oh, yeah. I already are. I already have an account on Spotify. Uh, but it's saying add or claim your podcast. So catalog? Yeah, I see. I'm already on Spotify. Links for the rest of us has uh in the last seven days 20 listens ddg has 39 listens somehow ddg is doing really good on spotify and i do not understand how uh it's literally destroying everything else because everything is submitted on spotify uh come podnuts computer repair nine podnuts pro three podnuts daily five android app addict six Lunch for the rest of us, 20, DDG, 39. I don't know. I don't get it. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to hop off here, go get some gas in my car, keep the wife happy. Oh, that's possible, Jonas. Now, here you go, Jonas. What I'm really tempted to do, I don't think it's too much work. I don't think it is. I think it's actually less work. I'm going to do a podcast, setting it up, normal length podcast, and then wait, don't release it. And literally sit here and record one minute episodes of every podcast I listen to. So literally every day at like 7 a.m. I release what will essentially be a two minute long episode. Because it will basically be 30 second intro, 30 second act- outro, minute descriptor of the podcast. And literally recording alphabetically at the first podcast. And then literally just going down the line, each one being its own episode. Cause if I don't, it's literally going to be a two hour episode of DDG and I don't want to do a two hour episode of DDG. So that's what I'm contemplating. The good news is I literally only had to do like seven at a time. And you saw how quick this was to edit. Well, imagine that times a hundred in speed, um, do seven a week, boom, 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 boom. Co- and copy paste the descriptions, copy paste the titles into seven different things and say, Publish this one on the 1st at 7 a.m., the 2nd, 7 a.m., the 3rd, 7 a.m., the 4th, 7 a.m. So every day doing a little blurb episode. Literally 150 podcasts I listen to is six months worth of podcast every day. I'm thinking about it. I might do it. I might not. I might. I would like to. The only way to find out is to listen. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to hop off here. I got to a- actually eat my dinner. I haven't eaten dinner yet. And then go get gas in the car because I got to do that. Take it easy, guys. <laughs>